If it wasn't written down, I simply would not believe it. These stories we're going to talk about today are, in my personal opinion, the height of hypocrisy. And the first we're going to go over is, unfortunately, an ETF approval. I say unfortunately because this is a leveraged futures Bitcoin ETF. Now, I know people are excited about the potential for a spot Bitcoin ETF, uh, which will come through hopefully with uh, BlackRock or Fidelity or Bakri or even Grayscale, even though they're going through uh, uh, legal uh, issues uh, between them and the SEC because they would not approve it. And we'll see what happens there. But the, the thing that shocks me and the whole thing about hypocrisy here is the reason that Gary Gensler of the SEC says that he is not going to approve uh, the spot ETF so far is because he's afraid of manipulation and he's trying to protect the consumer. And when I take a look at this, I just think to myself, is this really protecting the, the consumer by doing a leveraged futures ETF? Well, whatever it is, it's going to happen because it has been, was approved. This is scheduled to launch on the CBOE, BZX exchange, on Tuesday, June 27th. Volatility shares 2x Bitcoin strategy ETF scheduled to launch on the CBOE next Tuesday, June 27th. And the reason I said this twice is because every time I hear about the CBOE and the CME and things like that, I always get a little flashback because the last time we had a nice little futures uh, ETF come through, uh, that was uh, the first one. That was on uh, December 18th when it went live. And this is on 2017. And if I could, uh, if you haven't, weren't there uh, when this happened, I was there. I was in the, uh, in, in the height of FOMO because I could not get enough Bitcoin. And we were seeing massive price appreciation. But then on December 18th, everyone was applauding this decision for this futures ETF. Everybody thought it was going to be awesome. Well, what we know now is a little bit different than what we knew then. And you just see here on uh, December 5th to December 2017, uh, we were going at 18,491 on the 6th of December. And now we kind of come here to the height, the 16th of December, 19,423. And after that, when the 18th came around, for some reason, a little bit of a dip. And we said, no, it'll be okay. It'll come right back. But that's not what happened because everybody shorted it like crazy. And that was beginning of a massive bear market. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen again. The question I have is, are we really protecting the, the consumer with a leveraged Bitcoin ETF? And really, what is the difference uh, in terms of this between a spot ETF? Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And here it gets a little even more interesting. So we know about Deutsche Bank, 1.4 trillion banking giant Deutsche Bank is going to come in with a crypto custody license. That's fantastic. That is good for mass adoption. We want to see that. And now we've got another one. Uh, Credit Agricole's Casse gains crypto custody registration in France. Uh, traditional finance giant has been rumored to be seeking the status for years, and it looks like they just put it in. So it seems like things are moving along quite quickly. And for whatever reason that is, uh, hopefully it leads to mass adoption. But just an interesting, interesting case. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. So Casse, the asset servicing arm of banking giants Credit Agricole, uh, has registered by French regulars to provide crypto custody service. It joins other traditional finance firms such as uh, Societe Generale's Forge and AXA Investment Managers uh, for doing this for crypto custody. Casse is not some lightweight. It has 4.6 trillion euros or $5.1 trillion of assets under custody and was rumored to be seeking the crypto regulatory status since 2021. I said this twice for a reason. And the reason for that is, I don't know if you know the CEO of Credit Agricole. I didn't myself, but his name is Philippe Brassac. He's a French business exec, currently the CEO of Credit Agricole, succeeded Jean-Pierre Chifflet. Uh, to the role in May of 2015. Fantastic stuff, Rob. Who cares? Why are you telling me this? I'm telling you this because of this reason. On 29th of April, 2021, Philippe predicted that Bitcoin would be worth less than a dollar by April, 2025. There's a nice little article I linked in the description. You can check it out. It's in French. If you want to read it, you can translate it with Google Translator. But essentially, that's what he said those years ago. It was going to uh, a dollar, which is very funny because, again, Credit Agricole, the financial giant was rumored to be seeking the status for at least a couple of years. This is in 2021. Let me do some quick math. Yeah, that's two years. So the same time the CEO was saying it was going to a dollar was the same time they wanted to get crypto custody. So again, a little bit of hypocrisy, 
but it gets even worse into the coup d'etat IMF. IMF, it's amazing how these things just converge in the right times. IMF capitulates on Bitcoin bans, says they are not effective. Now, if you weren't following this, which we really haven't talked too much about this in, in, on this channel, but the International Monetary Fund has come on and said that it is a bad idea, especially with El Salvador, to make Bitcoin legal tender. It will lead to the collapse and it will lead to problems, and they should ban it. Now they're coming back and saying, you know what? Hey, that wasn't a bad idea. So this is what's been going on. The IMF is changing its tune on crypto. IMF economists released a report examining cryptocurrencies. In their report, the economists leaned into a position closer to adopting cryptos, but within a well-regulated framework. And they state, while a few countries have completely banned crypto assets given the risk, this approach may not be effective in the long run. And just there, I thought, well, it's not too, too exciting for what they're saying. They're saying, you know, very conservative. But it's these last sentences that got me. The IMF months earlier said in another report that countries should consider banning crypto. Just months ago, V was held by a handful of directors on its board, but the consensus, even though they leaned towards better regulations over a ban. So at least it wasn't everybody. And now all of a sudden, this is what they said. IMF economists said that cryptocurrency offered a number of benefits to its adopters. They wrote that crypto offered protection against macroeconomic uncertainty, promoted financial inclusion, and faster payments, among other benefits. Let me read that one more time. They wrote that crypto offered protection against macroeconomic uncertainty, maybe when things get inflated out the window, like Venezuela and Greece and what we're doing here in America, promoted financial inclusion, helping to bank the unbanked, people that can't actually use a bank or get a loan and actually uh, increase their <sighs> prosperousness on this earth, and faster payments, among other benefits. It's amazing to me how they did a 180 in such a short amount of time. But again, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just glad that they went on the right side. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And lastly, I just want to say congratulations to everybody who has been uh, dollar cost averaging. That would be myself included, as we are daily DCing Bitcoin. This is uh, from Wicked, and I'll link uh, this individual's uh, Twitter accounts uh, in the description below. You can follow them. And he states, not every, nearly every Bitcoin, only daily DC errors is now in profit. No matter when they first started dollar cost averaging, when the entire orange line goes below the dotted line, that's when all daily DCAers are in profit. So no matter when you started to de daily DCA, apparently this is the time. And uh, most or if not everybody, close to everybody, should be in profit as we're DCAing moving forward. And of course, the very last one, I'm going to speed this up because I want to see the whole thing. But again, uh, once the orange line goes below the dotted line, that's when all daily DCAers are in profit. You can see it right here. So again... Fantastic. I know DCAing might not be the sexiest thing to do out there, but it is the most effective. And it's one thing that I like to talk about. And we, we talked about this yesterday in NFA Live. I just wanted to, there was something I missed. There's a great website. <clears throat> it's called DCA-CC. Uh, I'll link in the description. And you can take a look at any kind of crypto in the top 20. And you can put in how much you, and this is historically looking back, how much you want to do per week, per month, per day, from whatever date point. And you can see how you would have done if you would have done that in the past. Now, moving forward, it's anybody's guess. I still think we're in the four-year cycles. But one thing I like to look at is, is how would you have done a year after the all-time highs? So that would be actually in just in 2018. I guess it wouldn't be a year after. It would be the next cycle. If you started DCAing Bitcoin a $100 every, every week, every seven days, and you waited till the all-time high, you'd be up a 7X. So you would have put in $20,000 roughly, and you would have had back 146,000. Well, that's pretty good. What if you would have done it and just waited until 2019? You would have had a six and a half X. And like I said, in the four-year cycles, the reset years are 2015, 2019, and in my opinion, 2023. I think this is the, me, my personal opinion, the best year to invest risk versus reward. So you would have done a six and a half X. You would have put in 15,000 and had almost 100,000 in that time frame, 2019 to 2021, just two years. If you would have got in closer in 2020, you would have had only a four X and then 10,000 to 42,000. And if you waited in the bull run year, you wouldn't really do too much. Now here's the tricky part. We know that Bitcoin is the safest option. 
the farther down you go on coin market cap, the riskier the cryptos are. So the second riskiest crypto would be Ethereum. And you can go all the way down to like number a thousand. It gets super risky, but there is gains to be had. And I'm not saying that's what you need to do or should do because I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not your dad. You can do whatever you want to do. But for this one, this is what we'd have historically. So Ethereum, the returns are much better. In 2018, if you invested, you'd have put in 20,000. You would have had 331,000 or 16x. If you'd have waited to 2019, you would have had 17x. It would have been even better. You would have put in 15,000, had $260,000. And again, and everything that I talk about here, there's a link in the description for this, this slideshow, and you can take a look at the numbers. 2020, if you would have waited, just an 11x, not too bad. In 2021, you only would have doubled your money, but in a short amount of time, so not too bad. And then, of course, the lower you go down, the higher the rewards are, but the higher the risk is. And this is where I made a good amount of money. Cardano, <clears throat> I was investing in 2018, and it was pennies. And uh, from that point to the very top, I could have put in 19300 I would have 686000 at the very tippy top. Now, that's if you sold at the top. Good luck to you. I didn't do that. But I came kind of close, but not near as I should have. 2019, you would have had 39x. You'd have put in $13,900. You would have had $549,000. 2020, 26x. In 2021, just a measly triple. And again, not all of these will come back over time. Dash assault. If you did a dash, you would have waited four years and got a paltry 3x, which sucks. Or for salt, you would still be underwater. And that's where we're at. So again, you can take a look at the website, DCA. You can take a look at anything like, like Chainlink, for example. $100 a week if you started on, let's go to 2018, the same thing, January 1st to today. And what I like about this is it could show you the returns. So at the very tippy top, wow. If you would have put in, you would have put in $17,600 and you would have got back a million seventy four. So again, Go ahead and play with this, uh, this data. And let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And lastly, before we take off, uh, today is uh, Friday. Uh, it is June 23rd. And tomorrow is Saturday at 5.30 Pacific, uh, 2.30, um, no, excuse me, 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific. Uh, we'll be doing the Lost interview, which I had interviewed um, <clears throat> the uh, Amp, Ampera Flexor founder, Tyler Spaulding. And uh, that will be put out. We talk about a litany of different things about, uh, about regulation and, and the comparisons between now and the past and the internet and where things are going with Flexa and Amp and Ampera and all that good stuff. So I will link that in the description. You can check that out. That is it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive, but that's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate you and I'll see you on the next one.